What's up, everybody? Welcome back in to another episode here where we have another motion to continue filed in Karen Reed's case right before, just a couple months before this trial is about to start. If you remember last time, a similar joint motion to continue, meaning both sides agree to continue this case, the judge denied it. But the interesting part about this is why. Why do they want this continuance? And do we think the judge is going to grant this continuance or deny it? We're going to look at this motion to continue. We're going to look at the affidavit where the prosecutor gives us the reasons why he wants to continue this trial and hopefully get all your questions answered. So I was tagged um, on a bunch of these on Twitter, and this one was Rich Vetsteins or Vetsteins uh, Twitter that somebody tagged me in. That's where I got this motion. The reason I wanted to read this one is because he also put the affidavit in there, which um, I hadn't seen in some of the other ones. If you can't read it on the screen, don't worry about it. As usual, we're going to read every single word here together. Make sure you hit that like button. Make sure you subscribe to our page if you haven't already. It is bright and early here. Um, I've got a mediation for most of the day today, so I had to record this early in the morning. I don't know when we're going to post it, but um, it's not going to be uh, as chipper maybe as usual because we're still waking up here, right? So we'll all get through it together and we'll get woken up this morning together as we read this motion to continue. So does the Commonwealth and defense joint motion to continue the trial date? So again, like I said, they are both in agreement here. It's not one side pushing for a continuance and the other side fighting it. There's no objection to this continuance. They both seem to be on the same page. So let's find out why. The case is scheduled for trial on January 27th, 2025. The Commonwealth and the defense are jointly requesting a continuance of the trial date until April 1st, 2025. So we also know how long of a continuance they want, right? So it's basically the end of January, we'll say beginning of February, so the month of February, month of March. So it's basically a two-month continuance. And I'll just give you a little tip out there for you young lawyers. If you want a continuance, saying you only want a short continuance ups your chances of winning by a lot. So both sides are saying, we need a continuance judge, just a short one. I talked about it about in the Sarah Boone case. I said, if he's going to continue the case, maybe just for a month or two, because it doesn't throw everything out of whack. Well, in this case, they do just that. Instead of January 27th, which is right after all the holidays, et cetera, we're going to just try to do it for April 1st, judge, on April Fool's Day. Wouldn't that be something for this case? Uh, the joint request will allow both the Commonwealth and the defense adequate time to prepare for the trial. Accommodate the schedule of new witnesses, including expert witnesses, will allow for the testing and disclosures by the experts timely before trial and will result in a far more efficient and streamlined presentation of evidence by both parties. So what are we learning just in this sense? Number one, new witnesses. We are going to have new witnesses. Now, we don't know because this is a joint motion. Is it just new witnesses for the prosecution, which we've heard rumblings of, or will the defense also have some new witnesses? Number two, including expert witnesses. We know that the state is going to have new expert witnesses. Will the defense, will we start to talk about the dog bite? Will we get a matchup with, you know, the, the, either the paw or the jaw of the dog with the injuries to John O'Keefe's arm? I don't know. Will we have those experts? Some of the timing of the, the first trial in pushing it forward, not allowing continuances, maybe had an effect on some potential expert testimony that the defense or the prosecution may have hired. People assumed the defense, but maybe the prosecution side as well because both sides wanted that continuance. All right, next, this will allow for the testing and disclosures by experts timely before trial. So as we know, there are always due dates and you have to get expert reports and expert testimonies and disclosures. What are they gonna talk about? What are, they, what are their opinions? We have to get those a certain number of days before trial. And because they're doing additional testing, we've heard about maybe some phone testing, some vehicle testing, some data testing, whatever it may be, Experts are doing more testing. They're going to give new opinions, new disclosures, new experts, and both sides have to know what the new experts are going to say, and that takes time. We don't want a trial by ambush. We don't want this to happen two days before trial or five days before trial. Uh, so they have to make sure they get all of this done in the time period to get the disclosures at the appropriate date before the, the cutoff and the deadline before the trial. And there, it sounds like, I mean, we're only two months, two and a half months till trial. So they're like, we're not going to be able to get that for the January 27th trial. We need Till April 1st, judge, in order to get these disclosures and new testing done. Uh, and lastly, this will result in a far more efficient and streamlined presentation of the evidence by both parties. So that's a little wink, wink as judge. It was so discombobulated last time and so repetitious and mundane and took forever and laborious to get through all of these witnesses to talk about the snow and whatever else over and over and over again, that guess what? If you give us these two months, 
we will be able to streamline this trial. It's going to be much quicker, much cleaner, and much tighter than the first trial. And that is something that's music to everybody's ears, right? I mean, that's what everybody wants to hear, especially Judge Canoni. Uh, and, and by the way, I do think that this gives us, gives us an indication, and we already kind of knew, that because she denied the continuance before the first trial, I do think that made everything more difficult. That made it more difficult on the prosecution to put things together, to get witnesses lined up, to have a clean, tight trial. It made everything more difficult for them. It also made things more difficult for the defense because there were late disclosures. There were things happening in the middle of trial where interviews were happening and they would come up with reports or videos that were transposed and all these issues that came up that maybe if they had more time wouldn't have come up or they would have had time to look through them or they would have had time to get experts or, you know, we remember the, the dog injury expert that they called that kind of reached out during trial and or right before trial and all that stuff was happening fast and furious that maybe a continuance would have fixed some of those problems, but the judge denied it, which is within her discretion. And guess what? We're back here again. The Commonwealth has recently filed a notice of its intention to retest forensic evidence. Further, the Commonwealth has provided notice to the defense that it has retained a biomechanical engineer who is expected to testify at trial. So that's big and that's important because the Commonwealth's experts weren't great last time. They didn't really do much to rebut the defense experts and they weren't really the defense experts. They're the FBI experts, third party experts, whatever you want to call them. They were called as experts during the defense case in chief. They testified consent. Cons uh, consistent with the defense's theory. So the state now is like, that wasn't great. Maybe that's why we didn't get enough people over the hump for at least um, one of the middle charges. So we're going to get new experts and that's going to be really important and they need to test and see the stuff for themselves before they come up with their opinions. The Commonwealth's biomechanical engineer cannot provide a report to the defense until the forensic testing has been completed, a time frame that is as yet unclear. So they don't even have this stuff set up. We're two and a half, half months before trial. They need to get the testing, set it up, have their biomechanical engineer do a report, do the disclosure to the defense so they know what he's testifying to. So if they need to talk to their experts, they can discuss uh, how we're going to respond to what the state's expert says. All that good stuff still has to happen. And the, the timeline of when they're even going to set all this up for the testing is still unclear. That's not great, right? That, that sounds like there is a lot of work yet to be done. Moreover, the Commonwealth has provided notice of additional experts who did not testify at the first trial and further intends to retain additional experts beyond those. So there were some that they already had that they didn't use that they might use now. And guess what? Yeah, we've hired a biomechanical engineer. Yeah, there are some experts we didn't use the first trial that we might use now. But then there are even more experts we may look into hiring that we don't have right now. I mean, that's completely open-ended and it's November. That feels like an impossibility to get all that done by January. But... Will we be able to get it done by April? They say yes. I don't know. This seems like a lot of work to be done. I think if, if Judge Canoni grants a continuance to April, no more continuances pass there, just based on her past uh, decisions. These new Commonwealth experts are also expected to generate reports following the testing and analysis, which the defense will need time to consider and potentially respond to, possibly with additional experts of its own, because that's how it works, right? If the state has an expert that they're going to bring that gives something new that the defense didn't know about or didn't prepare for before, well, now the defense needs time to either go and have their, I keep calling them their experts, but the FBI experts to respond to whatever the state brings, or if they can't respond or won't respond, the defense may need to go hire some of the experts of their own. And I actually think because the defense is not going to have the same pop as they did before with, um, you know, this is the first time we've ever spoke. We never talked. I don't even know what you guys are doing, right? Because you were hired by a third party agency. Well, they're not going to have that because they've talked to them before in the first trial. So they're still going to be able to do some version of that, but it might not hit quite as good. I don't know how good it hit with the first jury, actually. But I actually think it might be better for them to differentiate, to hire their own expert and say, you were hired by the defense, you were paid by the defense team, right? And this is your expert, right? And then juxtaposition that with, you are not paid by us. You are not hired by us. So they know that one of the experts was paid by the defense and one was not, and this one is still good for the defense, even though they weren't paid by the defense, because maybe the jury missed that or thought, okay, this is the state's experts, this is the defense experts, because they didn't have anything to really compare it with on the defense side. The Commonwealth will be filing a Rule 17 request and motions in limine and at least one Lanigan hearing for one of the defense potential witnesses. We'll talk about what those are when we get to the affidavit. The Commonwealth also expects to file a motion for reciprocal discovery and defense expert disclosures. Uh, it is expected that this evidence will be relevant and material to the Commonwealth and, of course, will need to be provided to the defense in order for the defendant to adequately be prepared for this trial. The Commonwealth is doing everything in its power to be as expeditious as possible to properly prepare for this trial and ensure the defendant is given a fair trial. 
The parties jointly believe, jointly believe that the additional time is necessary in order for both sides to be prepared for trial and litigate any additional matters prior to the trial. Therefore, and therefore provide a more efficient, streamlined, and shorter presentation of uh, to the jury. So what's important about this? It's very clearly to me written by Hank Brennan. But at the bottom, you see signatures from Hank Brennan, Alan Jackson, and David Yannetti. So what does that indicate? It doesn't indicate that they all wrote it, but what it does indicate is this was shared probably by Hank Brennan or his office to Alan Jackson and David Yannetti if they wanted to make any changes about what he said the defense might need to do. Because if you notice, he speaks for the defense here. The defense is going to have to provide some discovery. The defense is going to have to look at our new disclosures. The defense might want to challenge or respond to or hire new experts. These are all things the defense might want to do. Where do we think he got that information? Now, he'll obviously know he's a lawyer, including being a defense lawyer, because he's a special prosecutor in this case. But the defense may have also told him, well, we may need to do this. We may need to do that if you're going to do X, Y, and Z. And that's how all of it gets into the motion. A version or draft is sent to both sides. Once they all agree to it, they all sign the bottom themselves. Then it gets filed. And this was all filed yesterday. So the defense agreed with everything in this motion. It doesn't mean they're going to agree with what the experts say on the state side, obviously. But they know about it. They're not springing on them. They're on the same page. It seems like they're working together, which is thumbs up. That should make everybody happy. They're able to work together, not pointing fingers yet about people being unethical or doing things wrong or whatever it may be. But they're working together. And again, they both seem to think that this second time around can be more efficient, more streamlined, and shorter. Three very important things to the next jury and to everybody involved. Now let's get to the affidavit of counsel supporting the joint motion to continue trial. This is Hank Brennan, okay? I, Hank Brennan, appointed a special prosecutor for the Norfolk County District Attorney's Office, do hereby state that the following is true to the best of my information and belief. On September 17th, I was sworn in as special prosecutor to represent the Commonwealth uh, in the trial of Commonwealth v. Karen Reed. So even that was only four months before trial. So now that we've added two more months, it gives them six months, which again, I think, if this is what you're committed to doing and you're all in on this case, six months is plenty of time to get the entirety of what needs to get done in this case done. <clears throat> on October 11th, I filed a notice of appearance. On October 11th, I filed the Commonwealth's notice of discovery with the court and provided the notice of discovery to the defense. The discovery notice included, but was not limited to, a copy of the updated Cellbrite report of web history, a copy of the CV of Judson B. Welcher, PhD, and the CV of Hannah Knowles. On October 11th, I filed a notice scheduling reassembly and testing of the defendant's Lexus telemechanics, sorry, telematics systems. Uh, the mo motion requested a 14-day hearing date. The defense requested the date of November 13th, and the Commonwealth agreed. So that's next week. Next Wednesday, we're going to have a hearing on that. On October 18th, 2024, I filed the Commonwealth's motion for records to Verizon and the motion for records uh, to Boston 25. Undersigned counsel is in the process of reviewing and indexing discovery. So this is a good sign, right? Indexing discovery is like organizing it. I love organizing it, putting it in the right files, maybe tabbing it, maybe uh, uh, bait stamping it, and then putting those bait stamps in a chart so you know where everything is and what each document is so you can just pull it out as opposed to being lost and not knowing where you are or what document you're looking for. Undersigned counsel has retained several new experts for trial and expects to hire additional experts. So they only mentioned one, I believe, the biomechanical expert, uh, they mentioned two experts where they produced their CV and told the other side about those two experts. Um, several to me means even more than two, and they expect to hire more. This is November 4th, folks, when this motion was filed, and they're going to hire even more experts. So they already have two, and there's going to be more. What is their expertise going to be? Is it going to be more cell phone experts? going to be even more accident reconstruction experts, biomechanical engineers, dog bite experts, who knows? But several more experts are coming, and that's important. Undersigned counsel intends to file several Rule 17 motions for records. So a Rule 17 motion for records, which we talked about, uh, which they mentioned in the motion, is just basically a subpoena to third party to get records, whether it's Verizon, whether it's Lexus, whether it's, uh, I think he's even going to mention some of the experts for the FBI. Maybe they're going to try to get more records from them. Those would be Rule 17 motions, and he expects to file several of them, which, as you know, can take time especially if they don't give you everything. We see motions to compel. We see discovery issues all the time in all of these cases, multiple motions, multiple hearing dates, getting time in front of the judge is never easy. So all of that is still to come in this case, which is going to take time. What I appreciate about this motion to continue is it's not on the eve of trial. It's not a week before trial. It's not even a month before trial. It's two and a half, almost three months before trial, plenty of time for them to be able to project out and say, judge, in five months, we're going to be able to get this done. So I, I do like that. It's professionalism we're seeing by these attorneys. Uh, undersigned counsel intends to file several motions in limine. 
So motions in limine, as you know, for the most, most part are to keep things out of trial, saying they're inadmissible. They shouldn't be allowed to come in for X, Y, or Z reason. Now, the interesting part about this is we've already had motions in limine in the first trial. We already had a lot of arguments, but what does Hank Brennan know? He brings a different eye, a different angle, a different perspective, a different way to look at this case. And he has the entirety, weeks and weeks and weeks of the first trial, the evidence that came out, the objections, the arguments, opening statement, closing argument, the defense's case in chief, what the defense said, the comments made by the defense attorneys to witnesses and in front of the jury. And so now he gets to go look at all of that and file his motions in limine and say, judge, they did this in the first trial. They better not do it here. And it could be something completely different that the, that the first prosecution team just didn't even think of. They shouldn't be able to argue X, Y, and Z. But now they know the defense's theory. Now they've seen the defense's cards. They've seen the defense's best shot. And now they're going to be able to promote their, or to, to produce their motions in limine based on them. Now, the defense can do the same thing. The only difference is they only know Lally's playbook. So they're only going to be able to file motions in limine or focus on what happened in the first trial and what they want to be different based on what Lally did. They don't necessarily know Hank Brennan if he's going to take a little bit of a different angle. Now, he can't just go rogue and do something completely different. I would be very shocked by that. But I think the upper hand with you know knowing what one side did and filing additional motions in limine might be sliding in the direction of the prosecution. If if everything was equal and it was the same prosecution defense team, major, major advantage to the defense because now they've seen what the prosecution is going to do and we've seen kind of how they've fought vigorously. I, I don't think this defense team is going to be outmanned by anybody, but I just think it's very interesting to have a brand new perspective looking through that entire trial and telling the judge, here are things that happened that should not happen, judge. They're inadmissible for X, Y, and Z, and let's make sure we limit them out for the second trial. Undersigned counsel intends to file a motion for a Lanigan hearing relative to one of the defense potential experts. So a Lanigan hearing is like a Daubert hearing. Um, if you may have heard that before, it's a challenge to an expert, meaning they can't testify because either they're not an expert, what they're testifying to is not appropriate testimony for an expert witness. Um, they're just wrong. They didn't use the proper standard with how they came to their opinion. It's not to a reasonable degree of scientific probability or med medical certainty, whatever it may be for their jurisdiction. So there can be a number of different objections that they have. But what this is, you get the report, you get the expert disclosures. You file a motion objecting to it. Usually you have a hearing where that expert comes and testifies. Then you make an argument. Then the judge makes the decision. It's not something that happens like that usually. But right now he says only one of the defense experts. So I don't know if this is the dog bite uh, lady that testified or if it's the FBI experts. Because <coughs> he doesn't mention who it is here. But that all takes time. And if the state's going to bring new experts, the defense might want to do the same thing because they don't know about these state experts yet. They don't know the state's expert disclosures yet. So once the new state experts give their disclosures, the defense might want to respond, object to them, have a, what is it called? A Lanigan hearing. We call it a Daubert hearing, challenge that expert. And the defense has every right to, but then guess what? The defense can respond to those experts, which may be more experts that the state then wants to challenge uh, the expertise of those new experts brought by the defense. So as you can tell, when you're getting brand new expert testimony, a lot of things can happen, a lot of motions back and forth. But I will also tell you, it's not unusual for us to be doing, for lawyers, trial lawyers to be doing a lot of the expert discovery, which is the bulk of what's left to do in this case now, um, in the last three to six months before trial. So this is not like, oh my gosh, they have so much to do. There's no way they're going to get it done by April, even by January. We do this all the time. Unfortunately, sometimes we're even taking expert depots in the middle of trial. It's annoying. It's not how it should be, but it's not impossible for a trial lawyer to do it like that. If you can prevent it, you should. But this is not, we're not up to the wire here, or down to the wire um, when it comes to expert testimony. And when I say expert testimony is what we're focusing on and what's really left to be done, that's uh, in comparison to the lay witnesses or the fact witnesses. What happened? What time did you show up? Where did you go from here? What did you see? Where did you pick up the taillight? That's all the lay witness testimony, which again, not a lot is, I mean, I don't know how much is going to change, but uh, that's very different than the what may change in the expert testimony realm when you're bringing in new experts, you're retesting data, you're having response or rebuttal experts. So a lot can change there. Undersigned counsel intends to file a discovery motion and or Rule 17 motion for the discovery relative to two accident reconstructionist experts called by the defendant at the first trial, called by the defendant, not hired by the defendant. So those are the FBI experts is my guess. Um, I have spoken with the defense it is agreed that a continuance is necessary for both parties to adequately prepare for trial. A continuance will allow the Commonwealth to retain, consult, and disclose all expert materials to the defense and further allow the defense to consider additional expert witnesses of its own and provide timely reciprocal discovery. 
So again, all this stuff is going to be being passed back and forth. We have to make sure each lawyer and each side has enough to respond to it. Um, they have enough time to respond to it. They have enough information to respond to it because if it was a you know utopian society and both sides turned over everything relevant and everything they should, then we may not have arguments. But what happens if the state expert doesn't turn over everything that they review, doesn't turn over everything that they consider, and the defense has to file a motion to compel? Well, then we have to have another hearing. We have to have arguments, motions back and forth, responses, all of that. So the fact that there are several new experts that have already been hired and potentially more experts that haven't been hired by both sides, there is still a lot of work to be done. And this is all happening at the same time that a brand new prosecutor is trying to catch up with and learn this case. So uh, there was something in the motion that I... Oh, a motion for reciprocal discovery and defense expert disclosures. So reciprocal discovery is just passing the discovery back and forth. What have you not given us? But the defense expert disclosures, I don't know if they mean for new defense experts or if they don't have appropriate disclosures for the experts the defense already has. So that's another thing that we may say, you know, the state may say, hey, defense, you have to provide this. And we may have an argument about that too. So do I think Judge Canoni is going to grant this continuance? Uh, so I think you probably, probably already know my answer if you've followed this channel at all. Yes. I think she is going to, and I think she should. But guess what? I guessed that she was going to grant the last one before the first trial, and she didn't, and I was completely wrong about that. I still think she should have, but she didn't, and it's within her discretion. So there's no guarantees that she grants this motion to continue, but I think she will. I think she should. Let me know what you think in the comments. Let me know what questions arise. Do you think this is a good thing for the state or a good thing for the defense if this continuance gets granted? Because guess what? Both sides want it. And none of these lawyers are stupid. So I think they know what's best for their case. They know the case better than any of us. So if they're interested in a continuance, they want a continuance, they think they need a continuance, then I think we should give it to them. That's usually how I look at the case. And if I was a judge, that's what I would do because it's like, you're going to come in and force them to go to trial. And then God forbid we get what the first trial looked like, right? Not the most streamlined, not the tightest, not the shortest trial in the world. All right. Hit that like button if you guys haven't already. Let me know what you thought. Let me know your thoughts on this continuance, on this trial, as I'm sure you're continuing to follow it as we are. Uh, but until next time, I'm out of here. Thanks for watching another episode of The Lawyer You Know. If you enjoyed the episode, please hit the thumbs up and share with your friends who may be interested here on YouTube. And don't forget to subscribe. You can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and TikTok. And don't forget to check out The Lawyer You Know podcast with new seasons dropping every quarter. If you have a case you want to talk to us about, if it's a personal injury case, wrongful death, catastrophic injury, car accident, or slip and fall case, please email us at lawyeryouknow at gmail.com. And of course, all these links I just mentioned are included in the description below on this episode and every episode. So until next time, this is Peter Tregos, The Lawyer You Know.